there, terrible listeners. I am not your GM today, Justin Eacock. We are not playing a game, so I don't have to be your game master. We're doing something a little differently. Uh, we've had people on the show in the past, and we're doing this again. You've already seen in the show notes, so I don't need to tell you. It's right there on the episode title, but allow me to have this moment of mystery with you. We are going to sit down for a nice little conversation with someone who has made several of the games we have played on the Terrible Warriors, uh, has helped write four games we have played on the Terrible Warriors, runs one of the uh, one of our favorite companies uh, we keep pulling games from here on the Terrible Warriors, uh, and I'm just really excited that he has agreed to uh, come and spend some time with us and, and say hello to our show, and, and we're going to talk into it. He has created The Play's The Thing, uh, which uh, we just wrapped up there, the the, the Shakespeare dramas. Uh, he has helped create, or he has created the uh, Our Last Best Hope, if you remember back there with uh, uh, Joshua and his floating Pluto head, uh, the RPG to save the world, successfully backed uh, the cartel Kickstarter I have. I don't know why I'm speaking like Yoda now. Uh, and uh, we hope to be playing Cartel soon. Uh, and uh, and that thing is out there constantly growing, uh, as well as uh, co-founding Magpie Games. And I think he's written on the Seventh Sea. And I'm just going to bring the volume up right now. Welcome to the Terrible Warriors, Mark Truman. Hey, nice to nice to be here. Ah, I mean, I, I the, the the list kind of goes on. Uh, uh, how did you get started uh, writing um, role-playing games. Let's just go right. Man, What's your origin yeah. story? Yeah, you make. I feel so old. I used to do <laughs> interviews, and they were like, "You have one game out. What is it like?" And now I'm like, "I have too many games for you to mention," which means I've been doing this too long. Yeah. So my partner and I, Marissa Kelly, um, were we met in Albuquerque, and we started hanging out and dating and spending time together. And we thought, let's let's do a project together. Let's do something fun together. And she's an illustrator, and I'm a writer. So we thought, well, we love comic books. Let's do a comic book. We did that for about 10 minutes, and we were like, wow, comic books are really hard. <laughs> what 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 is easier than a comic book? And I, we both thought, well, we met playing role-playing games. Why don't, we, why don't we make a role-playing game? And we thought, I don't know why, we thought that would be easier or something. Um, and so we actually ended up going to Gen Con to just kind of see what Gen Con was like. It's the biggest industry convention, so let's sure. go there and kind of see what's happening. Um, and I had just kind of left a couple of big LARP groups, like I played in, in some White Wolf LARPs and the Camarilla, and I was interested in seeing, well, what are other people up to? What does the indie scene look like? And um, while we were at Gen Con, we ran into Daniel Solis, who is the creator of uh, Doe, Pilgrims of the Flying Temple, and Will Heinmarch, who's wrote, written for White Wolf and is the creator of Project Dark and a bunch of other things. And like, Basically, they were like, hey, do you want to go to lunch? And we were like, we don't know you, but you seem very nice. Sure, yeah. And Daniel had just finished the Doe Pilgrims of the Flying Temple Kickstarter, which had raised, like, at the time, just an insane amount of money, like $25,000. It was just nobody had ever raised that much. It was crazy. And both him and Will were like, you guys should do a Kickstarter for your game. And so when Marissa and I said, okay, we're going to do the plays, the thing, we'll do a Kickstarter, figuring... Most of the people that would back it would be like our friends and family. Sure. Yeah. As it turned out, like the only people who listen none to of show. our right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> almost none of our friends or family backed this thing. Uh, they didn't have any interest in an indie role playing game, but luckily, a bunch of other people did, and so our five hundred dollar ask became five thousand dollars. Amazing. And it, it yeah, it literally yeah. felt like winning the lottery. It was crazy. And I mean, the plays the thing. I recall it, it. It it didn't just start as a Kickstarter. It was started as a Game Chef game, correct? Yeah. It was like a, yeah. one of those weekend forty-eight hour challenges to create a game, sort of like the game jams you hear about. I, we got some game video game developers that have been on the show, and they get like uh, forty-eight hours to make a game from scratch or a board game from scratch. And it was just a similar idea. For sure. I mean, we we did Game Chef in yes. What was that like? Two thousand. 11 I think and one of the ingredients was Shakespeare so uh, I'm sitting there thinking okay well what what can I do with Shakespeare and the irony is that I, I was actually an actor when I was younger I was in the, the thespian club in high school and did like shows abroad where we went to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival and all this stuff and I remember being in the Globe Theater we did this this workshop about them talking about what it was like to be an actor in that particular time where you would receive a very small amount of your lines. You would get like just one page of lines for that day because that's all that had been written. And 
I love the idea of the text of a play as a negotiation between the actors and the director. Um, that was obviously not my experience as an actor, but I liked, yeah. <laughs> I liked the idea that like when you were first proposing these plays, you might say like, you know, I know Ophelia is supposed to die here on page 50, but like, what if she just didn't? Yeah, what, what if she joins a group of pirates and runs off and starts her own empire? And exactly. exactly. <laughs> there's a, right, and <laughs> there, I actually have uh, Ryan North uh, here in Toronto does dinosaur comics, put out a choose your own adventure uh, book. Uh, for uh, I think it was uh, I think it was Hamlet, and it was uh, yeah to be and or not to be and uh, I love that book. It was yes, it was totally so great. Have it. And, and there yeah. was this bit there. It was uh, there was a bit of that feel when we were playing through the plays, the thing where we're taking this uh, you know the, these legendary story and just destroying it uh, and turning it into something completely unique and original and different, but also shredding uh, <laughs> what the story used to be. Yes, absolutely. And and my goal was was to give people the tools to constructively deconstruct. Shakespeare's stories, right? So if you if you're a big fan of Macbeth, but you think it might be better if Macbeth was also a fairy, and if Lady Macbeth might actually be the lover of Banquo, and ta-da, like it's a brand new story with with a couple of key changes. Our Lady Macbeth ended up uh, killing uh, Macbeth uh, in the third act uh, in his Perfect. bathtub. Uh, he was having a he was having a bath because he was just so pretty and uh, uh, bled out, and uh, she then raised an army to go meet up everyone in England before they had a chance to come and stop her taking control of Scotland. And uh, at they, at the battlefield ended up happening south of the border rather than up in Scotland. <laughs> and and, it, it, and uh, I think at the very beginning, it was uh, Banquo ended up actually just being a horse in disguise the whole time. It was just like... <laughs> Uh, was it, what is that? What is that TV show horse? Uh, it was it was exactly like that, and uh, uh, it actually ended up having the disguise tool that you had written in. Uh, so at times he would walk around as if he was just a regular person, and then other times would be a horse that could also talk and do all his lines as normal. And it was right, and I think <laughs> part of this part of the influence here is also like the thirty minute Shakespeare's and the yeah the sort of all of this sort of deconstruction of the the bard as this legendary institution. But he was but plagiarizing of, everyone around him as well, right? Exactly, like like that right, was a time where yes. all these writers were taking ideas and remixing and doing things in, and sometimes they'd be improvised and sometimes they'd be written down. And that was a really good story. I'm going to take that character and yep. uh, how much of his stories that we have were wholly original and how much were just completely remixed like something off of SoundCloud. Yeah, and and also how bawdy and rough and over the top they are. Um, it's, It's absolutely the case that what we think of as the classics were viewed by many people as like the lowest of the low, the, the, the television of the, of that time. He paid period, no right? attention so, to grammar. He was, those aren't even real words he was using. And <laughs> exactly. So giving players the tools to remix that stuff is for me, uh, kind of returning Shakespeare to, uh, a sense of creative and chaotic, uh, entertainment. Yeah. And the, the only problem of course is, and this is sort of points to some of my later work, the only problem is that you, you kind of have to know what's going on to do that, right? And one of the things I think a lot about uh, as, a, as, a, as a writer and a creator is what am I asking my players to know or what am I asking them to do in order to play this game? And one of the challenges of the plays, the thing is, it's hard to deconstruct a thing you may or may not know that yeah. well. I, I so, had a big uh, challenge as the playwright who didn't really have a Shakespeare background. I had a lot of players who right. did. And sure, by our fourth hour, it started to just get less and less focused. It was harder and harder for right. me to keep things on track because I, it was hard for me to improvise around something I just didn't have a familiar territory with compared to something like Our Last Best Hope, uh, which right. was it, it, its mechanics are all – they keep feeding into each other. You get a scene that leads to a threat, that leads to a scene, that leads to a threat. that lead, And we never at any point felt like the pacing slowed down or we didn't know where to go next because we had all these wonderful prompts with our secrets and our fears and our touchstones. And we could always look at some. I don't know what – well, I'm going to just use this and, and – and, yep. and catapult myself in that direction or you know what I'm done I'm using my death card <laughs> and exit stage right yep. and 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 I'm we ended done. up yep it, it never slowed at any point we never had a a, a moment of of silence at the table we're all just kind of looking going well what do we do now uh, and it just yeah, and then, and that, until that it was came, over 
Totally. That came directly out of my ex- exposure, honestly, to the rest of the indie community. So when I was working the plays, the thing, you know, Marissa and I had met very few people when I first did that, did the Game Chef, met very few people in the indie community. We didn't go to Gen Con until August of that year. We didn't really know anybody. We're from Albuquerque, right? We're very far away from the rest of the indie community in Seattle or in sure. the Northeast. And and then we met all these people and we started playing games like Fiasco, obviously, or other GM-less games. I believe we had played um, Dog Meat Dog by that point, too. And I just loved the idea of the small footprint of a GM-less game. No one person has to learn the whole system. It's, it's up to everybody to play yeah. the game together. I love the GM-less games. Our first exposure to that after Fiasco ended up being Norlandia and then working from Norlandia yeah. backwards to our last best hope and having these... Uh, the, the, these places where we're all in it together. No one is leading the pack here. We're not part of someone else's um, story. The GM tends to be the host as well when they're running a game, and we're coming into your world, uh, and you're going to help sort of, you know, you're the narrator through most of that. Uh, whereas something like Our Last Best Hope, it's, it's, it's completely uh, wild. Yeah, and I think, you know, for, for us, um, I'm, I'm really interesting, interested in ways that, role-playing games can be democratized like one of the big models of role-playing games that i grew up with was there's one gm who kind of knows everything there is to know about the system and everybody else kind of participates on that person's terms right i think that's a lot of people starting in with dungeons and dragons where i started uh yeah you've got your dungeon master you've got your quests you've got your these are the monsters to fight and here's what you have to do roll this dice and you just kind of go into the room and you're just told do a dice check roll through here have this and it's it's a little right. more press a press b forward left right and and then you get into a story based game like this where it becomes less being told what to do you know what i mean right yeah and and with your last best hope right so the the idea from the place the thing was to learn the lessons that I saw at the table of people struggling with the the spread, right? The the chaotic, creative nature of the plays. The thing can often often be an obstacle to making much progress in the story. And what our last was hope did was give you um, not some rails, but some some like guidelines, right? For like what a story looks like. And over the course of that two or three or four hours of play, you get a really compact story in which many of the characters die. Some of them may live, but you have to confront the the awful crisis at yeah. the end. And that, that matched a bunch of my favorite movies, right? I mean, from Sunshine to, um, well, you know, well, Pacific Rim. Uh, Brie, had Brie had never seen, Bree had never seen Sunshine. Uh, and as I'm reading these rules out to her when we were getting ready for the game, um, yeah. uh, I, I was like, "We have to watch Sunshine." And playing Sunshine, <laughs> watching Sunshine immediately before, before playing Our Last Best Hope was per. You you took somehow you got Sunshine the movie and turned it into a role playing game, uh, uh, and, right. and it felt beat for beat that way. And and the. The cards that you make at the beginning of the game, even including the death card, were like uh, you have one block of a storyboard on your table. It's not in the story yet, but you're putting them in as you go, and and it's slowly assembling itself. Uh, even if you're not sure on what the next square is going to be, the threat cards you know being shuffled around and added as we go, um, it did feel like we were slowly like we we having those those physical blocks at the table to to anchor us, as then we could then go crazy with our characters because no matter how crazy it would get red alert would happen there's a whole breach now we got to deal with this right the the goal of our last best hope was to give people a very clear sense of the next scene at the table and i think that for me running into apocalypse world then after that like i think we published um our last best hope in 2012 2013 and that was when i first encountered apocalypse world and it had it, in a weird connection that i I don't even know if I've thought about it until today. It has the same kind of feeling of everything you need to understand where to go next in the story is in front of you. Yeah. When you play Apocalypse World, you get a playbook, and the playbook says you're the brainer or the hard holder or the gun lugger. And on your playbook is a whole story, like ready to be unpacked. You're making choices about something as simple as uh, what your hard hold looks like, like, oh, it's got these rebar walls or, um, you know, everybody here is hooked on a like really weird ap- post-apocalyptic drug or whatever. But every one of those is a tool for the GM to then bring into the mm-hmm. story and pursue the story you've selected. And so 
they the become ingredients of, for them to then construct this yes. custom-made meal that they wouldn't have been able to do without that input from the origin. My first Apocalypse yeah. World, powered by Apocalypse game, was Monster Hearts. Um, and we did that yeah. here on Terrible Warriors. And I loved how the rules of that game, so, like Monster Hearts, you're playing as teenage monsters who really don't have like the emotional maturity of adults. They don't know what kind of monsters they are. They're, everything's conflicted and you have hormones. And uh, and playing as adults, uh, looking, you know, it, the rules corral you into becoming, getting under your skin into this world where you don't even have, like, the moves work together as a team are not available until you've leveled up a few times. All you right. have are manipulate and seduce and roll hot. And, and so you, you end up becoming this... A dirtbag teenager quite quickly uh, without even realizing <laughs> that the game has conditioned you in that way. And I found, you know, even the same with Apocalypse World, powered by Apocalypse games have this great mechanic of just by the nature of their limited moveset and playbooks of of already like uh, conditioning you into this setting so that you're going to be in this frame of mind. And, and I love that. And then, and then as the GM running it or the MC, Having all that information give to me, oh, this is what you're concerned of. This is what you really want out of your character's life. This is, you know, uh, our our werewolf player was, you know, was very much a power fantasy, and he wanted to be the jock. And oh, cool, now I know all the things I can take away from you during the game. What's important right. to you, uh, and and challenge you. And I wouldn't have had any of that if I had tried to plan something like that in advance in any other yeah. kind of game setting. Yeah, it's interesting because I I, th- I feel like there's a big shift in my career from. From our last best hope to uh, Apocalypse World and Apocalypse World Engine games, but at the same time, I was also doing other things like working on the Firefly RPG from Margoish Productions and Doe Fate of the Flying Temple for Evil Hat, and and writing, um, you know, a, a bunch of other freelance pieces for various people. And so there was a kind of a slow transition. But the the thing that I really wanted was I wanted players to sit down at the table and have you know, this is really loaded, but like an immersive experience. I wanted them to feel the way their characters felt, if only for a moment. Yeah. And uh, you that's wouldn't harder know to this. do than it sounds. You wouldn't know this. Our Monster Hearts game, that werewolf character uh, of ours, um, yeah. it was the only time in the history of this show where someone's walked out in the middle of, of one of our games. He, uh. his, his player, <laughs> um, I, 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 his, his dad had been revealed to be the big bad all along. He was an adult version of the Infernal and uh, uh, killed off one of the players because they had to leave, they had to go home. So I was like, great, I'm gonna get to kill them. And, uh, uh, and then left to the devices of one of the other players who had started going more and more dark side. Um, and, and, and this like, it was it was it was it was getting quite brutal, and he was losing everything, and he, all of his fantasies of what his character was going to become were slipping away from him, and and he got he just got so upset. He's like, I'm done. I I have to. I'm I'm out. And and we, he came back to the table, and and we finished up the game. But it was this. It, we'd never had a moment where something had gotten that much under the skin uh, of a player, and and a lot of that had to do with the way the rules were like. You invest yourself into this character. The story is unique yeah. every time, and 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 it's you're no one else will ever experience this game this way with 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 this with these ingredients, uh, and and yeah. and you end up taking an ownership of that when you're without even realizing what's happened to you. Uh, this becomes yours, and uh, more than the cleric I played for years in Dungeons and Dragons. That was it was just a class. It was just selecting a player on a screen. Um, this felt something else. Right, I don't know. I mean, yeah, we're just waxing well, they, philosophically, but well, it, I think it's interesting because the there's there's a there's a part of our last best hope that I think drove me toward games like Urban Shadows, which was that while our last best hope has a lot of great tools for telling an arc of a story, that arc tends to be the same arc every time, right? Like that's what it's designed to do. Yeah, is it's it's designed to give you a disaster movie. Guess what? Disaster movies kind of all go the same way, right? Like that's that's why we lay it out that way. Now, what's touching about our last best hope is that it takes the structure, which I think of as like the you know like a garden structure. It's got rows. It's got it's got these little boundaries. It's got seeds and these orders. And from that spout sprouts something really different and amazing when the players engage it. Yeah, but beat for beat, it's roughly going to follow the same trope yep. to the end. There's going to be sacrifices, there's going to be challenges, yep. and there's going to be one or a few at the very end for a final confrontation to everything has to be put on the line. And and those tend to be, regardless of the setting and the characters, it's going to be the same 
game of Jenga each time. And what's, what was really important to me was that that game of Jenga, right, was felt like people had real stakes. And yeah. so what's interesting about our last best hope is you can lose. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> right, like you, you could roll at the end and you could not have built up enough dice. You can actually lose. And the crisis wins and the end of your story is a kind of like sad but have, tragic. Have you seen you know, Infinity War yet? I have, I have, yeah. yeah. Exactly, yeah. They didn't yeah, have enough yeah. dice at the end of that movie. They, they perhaps did not and have enough dice. he yeah. snaps his fingers, <laughs> and that's it. Your game is over now. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, well, except except one of the outcomes on their last best hope is that there's just enough chance yeah. for a sequel, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, if you just rolled just under movie, it. Just under it, yeah. Yeah. Um, you didn't stop the crisis, but you've delayed it enough to allow for another yeah. plan. Or you found some some new way of moving forward, yeah. right? And I think for something like Monster Hearts or Urban Shadows or Apocalypse World or Masks or any of these Apocalypse World Engine games, what I love is that they strike a balance a lot between the first two games I wrote. They have this sort of chaotic, creative, frenetic energy, but with that, enough structure to keep your games moving forward. Um, and so once we found that, like as a, as a crew, the Magpie crew, we were very interested in exploring it. And there's a reason that, you know, five out of our last six games or something like that are powered by the apocalypse is because it gives us this flexible engine that allows us to tell really interesting chaotic creative stories but it never abandons the players and never says well good luck figure out what to do next yeah and and that's uh, you know masks is one of those games we 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 played it ended up playing it twice here i now play it privately with my friends uh introduced it to a group of friends who um uh, I, we went to high school together. We played Dungeons and Dragons in high school. And where I went off and you know did my own thing here in Toronto and, and got introduced to all these other crazy games, uh, they're still playing Dungeons and Dragons and hadn't really gotten away from traditional role playing games. Uh, and sure. uh, and then you know we got a little lull in time. Let's connect on Google Hangouts. Have you, could I show you guys masks? What would you like? And now they're like, this is the greatest thing. I've never even knew this was possible in a game. This this kind of immersion and and storytelling and agency over our characters uh and uh, and they're so sucked into this teenage superhero melodrama that they've created um and it was almost effortless once uh once you get through that character creation uh and and you and you create all your ties that bind you together um i love it Uh, powered by the apocalypse games have like redefine my entire expectations even when i when we go off to play fate games or return to more traditional or uh, like star trek adventures it, it, it i keep coming back to those like no man we're doing this cinematically and i have this expectation now the bar has been raised right that's awesome that's great yeah i mean i i've talked to a lot of folks who i mean D D is so interesting because it's kind of its own genre let alone yeah. its own style of game um and i've talked to a lot of people who really enjoy the way that D D. Um, gives them tools to tell the kind of stories they want to tell. So I'm, I'm always hesitant to embrace this kind of like, and then we evolve into this oh, and next I'm not, level. I'm not meaning to slam yeah. D&D. I, just, no, no, I see it the no. way like someone who's only ever played Monopoly and never learned about Pandemic and Settlers of Catan and, and, and all the other styles of board games out there. I, I do think having played other rule sets, I go back to D&D, and we do play D&D on Terrible Warriors, um, Yep. My experience is better because I have different expectations yes. in what I expect totally. my character to be capable of. D&D yeah. doesn't teach a player necessarily how to construct those narratives the way uh, Apocalypse World almost does without trying. Uh, right, and, and there's other games like Blades in the Dark that do a yeah, thing that exactly. Apocalypse with the World flashback can't sequences. do or won't do. Yeah, absolutely. Like You can't be messing with time like that in Apocalypse World games. doesn't work. Like the, the the play to find out what happens means that for the most part you need to be rolling forward in the fiction. Yep. You can't you can't be constantly jumping backwards. But like yeah, there, there's a thing that D and D does really well, and that's be D and D. And so if I when I played D and D, I really wanted it to be fate. <laughs> Yeah. And it's not very good at being fake, right? No, so no. It's a little it, bit like... But at the same time, there are there are there are certain games like you know we, you, if you want to play the Seventh C, uh, it's it's not go- the combat is not going to play out like Dungeons and Dragons. It's not going to have that same. You get to you know call out your 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 what you're preparing to do and you're doing all your raises. But if you want to get down to a more um, strategy of of formations and and how we're going to overcome this and and try and outthink our way. It doesn't really right. do that the way Dungeons and Dragons does. You can right. you can get into a nitty gritty with 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 that play uh, that 
few other games uh, really allow. Um, but at the same time, something like 7C allows you to jump off uh, the banister and swing through the chandelier and land in the room and pull out your rapier and cut down all the ropes all in one go. And in Dungeons & Dragons, it would take you three and a half hours. And yeah, that's and if you have you those feats and skills learned <laughs> up ahead of time and if you've got enough stamina. Yeah. And, 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 and I, I remember just, you spe- I spend more time falling on my face when I'm playing Dungeons & Dragons until I started you know, redefining my expectations. Yeah, well, the, the biggest thing for me is that even over the last 10 years that I've been involved in uh, role-playing game design and um, running games at scale, like participating in LARPs and things, I've seen people change their attitudes a lot about what is included in role-playing games. So it used to be that maybe role-playing games was D&D plus some other stuff. And now I feel like it's D&D plus a whole world of stuff that people are comfortable understanding as part of their hobby. It yeah. may not be their first game, may not be their go-to game, but the idea that Monster Hearts is a game that many people have played as their primary game yeah. is amazing to me. That's great. Yeah, I know. Um, uh, there's a so, play group around the corner from where I live, and all they do is Urban Shadows. Uh, I was helping my friend awesome. move in as a roommate, and they're like, oh, they're playing tabletop. I'm like, oh, yeah, well, what game? Because I do this podcast, and I'll oh, do yeah, Urban Shadows. Yeah. I'm like, get out of here. Really? Like, I was expecting <laughs> Pathfinder. I was expecting anything, yeah. and I wasn't expecting this uh, the, uh, Urban sh- I was like, that's amazing. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I have situations where, where I was at an art gallery uh, for an opening uh, from Jabari Weathers, who did all the art for the tarot decks for Bluebeard's Bride and Seventh Sea. And this woman uh, was there and, and she said, oh, what's this all for? And we were talking about games. And she's like, oh, I play role playing games. And I said, OK, well, what do you play expecting you know, to be D&D? And she says, well, mostly I've played Blades in the Dark. And I was just like, I must have looked like somebody slapped me because I was like, what? That's crazy, right? And started talking about Blades in the Dark. And that just, that experience has happened to me way more over the last yeah. uh, couple of years than it did the previous seven or eight. Yeah, years. where it used to be the, the, you'd have, you know, this, this big behemoth of a game in the center. Now it's just a neighborhood among all these other communities uh, that, that, that and it, it is richer. I, I, I don't want to lose Dungeons and Dragons. And I do think that the latest edition and the work they've done to the, it is some really cool, new, neat changes they've done to it. Um, but I, I, I know I, on, on, on the show, I sound like I'm always railing against it. Uh, part of it is it doesn't really lend itself to actual play to our format. Um, oh, and, interesting. Right? Like, it's, it's, if you don't have the battle grid, you're not going to, anyway, you can't really do them in one hour chunks in a way that the story feels like huh. it did anything, um, unless you start hacking away a lot of the rules and ignoring stuff and then running more fast and loose. Um, whereas uh, games like Masks, um, it was no issue for us to do uh, what felt like a full comic book issue in four hours. Uh, the, the beats That's just cool. kind of flow their way through it. Um, so the uh, I mentioned Seven C. I know you've you've written for Seven C, right? Yeah. Well, I I worked with John to put together the Kickstarter. I was the business manager for John Wick Presents. Yeah. Um, from basically like the entire run of the the Kickstarter through the next two years. And John also helped you edit um, uh, plays the thing as well. That's right. Yeah. John John Wick was was my hero, man. I read the, the Houses of the Blooded was my first indie game. And I met John at a LARP in Phoenix when I was out on a business trip. And I was looking for an editor. And I said, hey, John, would you be willing to edit this? And he said, yes. And he edited it. It was an awesome experience. And from there, we started working together on other projects. I did a little bit of uh, Kickstarter advising for him on some of his projects like Wicked Fantasy and things. And then... Um, in 2015, uh, he said that he wanted to get the 7C license back. And I said, well, John, that's, that's going to be tough because we don't have it. It's not ours. <laughs> and he said, well, I want to talk to AEG. So we went and talked to AEG, and they weren't doing much with it, so they offered to sell it to us. And so we worked out a deal in which John was going to get his intellectual property back. He was going to get the world he made back, and AEG was going to get um, get a cut of, of what we did. And nobody predicted. I mean, I, I feel kind no, of guilty. No, history was made. Yeah, exactly. Well, I feel guilty because they said, well, you know, lots of these projects raise a million dollars. And I actually started laughing on the call. I was just, I was like, nobody has raised a million dollars. That's crazy. There's no, there's no way that's going to happen. And then we did it. And then we did it. Like, 
<laughs> like a snap of the finger. Yeah, it was like a snap of the finger. Yeah, that's it. So, um, and then yeah, I I took on developing the New World book, which is the Mesoamerican book. I think of it as my like Latino Wakanda, mm-hmm. uh, where the uh, the Aztec, Maya, and um, Incan people are represented by three new Seventh Sea nations. So I uh, helped to develop the core of that that product and and. Um, at the end, I, I wasn't able to finish it some, somewhat because I was too busy doing so many other things for John and for the company, but also just I had some health stuff and had to step away. Um, and Danielle uh, Lawson finished it up. Um, Danielle is a, a really, really gifted um, developer and writer, and she's been part of the 7th C team for a long time now. And she took on the book and actually got it to print, so I, I just owe her an eternal debt for making that happen. Um, but the book is done and it's out in stores now. You can get it. Um, it is absolutely a kind of uncompromised vision of Mesoamerica uh, focused on indigenous people. Um, it is absolutely the Wakanda for me of um, what would the world look like if colonialism had never happened. Um, mm. And it's, it's really exciting. Uh, we had a we had a real fun time playing through uh, uh, Seventh Sea last year. Um, ours was a typical Inquisition Castilian love yeah. triangle. We had to shepherd cool. this this guy out who was being forced into a marriage he didn't want, so he could fall in love with Philippe out in Montaigne. And uh, uh, and then and then things got weird when our uh, uh, one of our player characters, uh, Bree, was playing a guy named Dirk, and uh, Dirk fell in love with the bad guy. Uh, it was like uh, you. Ooh, I'm, I'm gonna have you, and 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 the bishop, the the bishop of the Inquisition. She was into it, uh, and I think the the line of the night was, "So few people understand our appetites." And there's just the the <laughs> rest of the players are like, "What is how? What are we in on now?" You know, Bree, you gotta. You're the hero. You have to remember. You can't go and sleep with the bad guy. That's uh. There's there's tropes here about this. Um, but I do have a question. Uh, 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 one of our uh, contributors, Mike Dodd. Uh, uh, who played uh, Jose Wick in in the Seventh Sea? Not knowing at the time that John Wick was the creator, it was. How does John uh, Wick perfect. feel about Keanu Reeves taking his thunder? Well, he he's always described the movie as his unauthorized autobiography. <laughs> of, so course, he's of course, of course. So Mike <laughs> played Jose Wick, and uh, he did want to ask, like, when you're writing, uh, and, and I know a lot of your games don't deal with lore. Uh, building, um, they, they right, they're more yeah. open ended. But when you are writing lore for a world, um, how do you do that in a way that makes it still accessible to new players? So when you're writing here for the Seventh Sea for the New World, um, is there anything you do to make it so that people can enter in at any point uh, and not feel like they're lost in the woods? I mean, it's certainly easier for our last best hope, right? We yeah. Say, we, say, <laughs> we say, so we're all making this up right here on the spot. Everybody is equally an expert. Yes, exactly. Uh, right here, right here in the moment. Yeah. I mean, even something like masks, right, has more of a setting, has more of a, an understanding of, of what it means to have, uh, like you said, lore, right? So Halcyon City has a few big rules that you have to play with. There have to be adult superheroes. Yeah, there's the generations. There a, yeah. Yeah. Yep, there has to be a big bustling metropolis. There has to be villains who yep. have superpowers. And right? you're a tiny Masks peg is... at the bottom of that totem, yep. and no one thinks Ma- you're going to amount to anything yet. Mask isn't going to work if you play it like Batman Begins. Right? No, like it has to. It has to be within a certain world. It has to be so, Teen Titans. You're not going. Yep, you're not exactly. doing Justice League. This isn't mutants and masterminds. This is a. Right. Ver- this is a. This is a particular type of story that you have to buy into. Totally, um, and. When I think about uh, what it means to make lore that's accessible to players, I think that it's important to recognize there's a couple of different big picture ways to do that. One of them is your players don't necessarily need to know anything about the world to play in it. What matters in some settings is that the GM knows stuff about the world. Um, And that works especially well for stuff like White Wolf. So, you know, if you have urban fantasy where there's a secret world and the players can play people who are new to that secret world, then only one person on the table has to know that stuff, right? Um, That said, that's a pretty rare case. Most of the time you're something like 7C, everybody's supposed to know broadly the history of reality, right? Like everybody yeah. should be familiar with their, there is a country called Aizen. You are familiar with Aizen. Yeah. The know the country, difference between right? uh, Avalon and Aizen and, and, and yeah. the, you know, the church of Thea. That's a big deal. If you don't know what Thea yeah, is up to, totally. you're, you're what rock have you been under? Yeah. 
Exactly. Yeah. And if you live half a world away, you live in Ifri or you live in uh, Aslan or wherever you live. Well, maybe you don't need to know about Thea, but you should know then about your own people, right? Yeah. And what their history is. You need to go through um, the Coles notes before you play. Exactly. Yeah. So what, what I try to focus on, and, and again, John is such a master of this, having done it, you know, two plus times. I mean, he did it for L5R and he did it again for 7C. Um, what I try to focus on are the big picture strokes of a world that are both evocative and familiar. So when I think about 7th Sea as a setting, I often say it is Pirates of the Caribbean plus the Princess Bride plus like Harry Potter. Right? Yeah, like, with like a touch of Indiana Jones and Zorro just to like round absolutely, it Absolutely, with all yeah. the swashbuckling that you would have when you look at those, those additional media, right? And what I'm trying to do there is give people a sense of like it's got a bunch of pirates and action and swashbuckling and backstabbing and it's trails the, and it's romance. It's the front cover of every Harlequin romance fantasy. Totally. <laughs> right? Plus magic. Yeah, plus right? magic. Plus, plus magic. Flowing right? hair, yeah. flowing dresses, and swords pointed to the sky. Yep, totally. And and with that, I think people can sit down at the table and say, cool. So so tell me about this Eisen place again. I'm like, it's, it's kind of like Germany, but like with monsters. And you're like, cool. That's close enough. I, I can play now. Um, yeah, we so had that in our people, game. It, different people yeah. like going, oh, I'm really into, you know, being a young Zorro character or... Isen, right. oh, that I'm going to be the Witcher, but I'm going to be terrible yep. at everything. But I'm going to be from Isen, and uh, or yep. or someone who was really the Montaigne and the Secret Sisters and that whole politics with Vidacci, and that I, that's really important to me there. And and you end up learning your own little corner of the world and bringing exactly. that to the table and teaching everyone else who the yep. Isen are or who the the, the sisters are. Yeah, and, and part of that for me is also why licensed properties are so popular, right? So if you say, well, I want to play a role-playing game, but I don't want to necessarily read a 500-page book, but I also don't necessarily want to make up everything at the table, playing the Star Trek Adventures RPG is a pretty good, you know, 50-50 split. Like, yeah. you might already be broadly familiar with Star Trek, and then you're probably kind of like have your own ideas about what you would do in Star Trek if you were a writer for the show. You know and who the allies are, you know who the there. foes are, you get some like, yeah. you know, the tropes to beam me up in the shuttlecrafts and, and then we can go from there. Exactly. And so part of what my job is with lore is to write something that is as accessible as a Star Wars or Star Trek RPG. Some, something that I can give to people that they jump on and immediately kind of get. So when I say there are Aztec warriors and Maya shaman and like, magic users and this Inca empire that's ruled by this empress who cannot die. You're like, check. Like, I get it. Yep. I totally see it. Yep. It's basically... I've read uh, that story. All these tropes. Yep. <laughs> I've read that story. I know what's happening. And then when we get into the details, and you're like, wait a second, the Aztec group is called the Noachan Alliance and has a really sophisticated, like, scholarly justice system. And I'm like, yeah. And you're like, oh, okay, cool. Let's go. Like, let's roll with it. Yeah, because you, I understand the you, big you've picture. Seen the, I've seen the big picture, and then you can start showing me some of the smaller notes that you've written around the sides. We met uh, Mark exactly. Richardson at Breakout, and uh, he's he's written, he's drawn the maps for 7C. And it was a similar yeah. process. He was saying, uh, drawing a map that looked from a distance like it would be Europe. Uh, or, yeah. or, or you know, if, if we're looking at just Thea, and then as you zoom in a little closer, you start seeing it. it, it the, 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 oh, this is different. This whoa, what am I looking at here? And the maps become like an infographic with things you need to know about the borders and the history and the geography. And just looking at that map already gives you a grounding of okay, nice. If we're here, I'm far from home. That gives me something else to work with with my character or I'm just across the sea. We just got to get across this narrow stretch and it, it ends up being a, yeah, I, I see what you mean about um, giving you something that you know of. I, we, we know what our earth globe looks like and the seventh sea being like 16th century Europe with the serial numbers filed off uh, gives right. you a bit of enough of, if you don't know everything about seventh sea, you can kind of fill in the gaps with our own history to ad lib your way into it. Yeah, and I think what's funny about a game like Shadowrun is it actually does the opposite, right? Like, it's it's got some rules around, like, hey, corporations are kind of evil and big. And you're like, yeah, that checks out. Yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't need to buy in. That just sounds like, yeah. yep, that just sounds like Amazon. There we go. <laughs> and, yeah, and there's, like, trolls and dwarves and elves and stuff. You're like, all right, cool, sounds good, let's roll. Yeah, the mayor of and Chicago's think... a dragon. Okay. <laughs> right. Check. Uh, I think when I've watched people struggle when they've pitched a game or when I've watched them play test a game that doesn't have a sense of touchstones, there's no place for people to accessibly 
enter the world. There's no tropes for them to rely on. There's nothing familiar. They're just new, more or less. They really struggle. And it's something that, on, on the subject of, of our games, right, it's something that we have worked very hard on for Cartel, which is, mm-hmm. I understand that Cartel, in many ways, does not have a setting in the sense that you're playing it in Mexico, but it doesn't matter if you get the neighborhoods right for the city it's set in. It does have a sense that you should know something about Mexico before you start playing the game. And my my biggest goal was to give people a sense of what narco fiction, drug fiction looks like in a game. And that hopefully relies upon The Departed, The Wire, Breaking Bad, Narcos, right? All of these touchstones that people have for what it looks like to play narco fiction. And that's their starting point, even if they might not know Mexico in particular. And I did. I absolutely want to talk about Cartel. I, I mean, disclosure, I'm a backer. I'm looking forward to getting the game. And awesome, uh, I was you. very excited when I saw it. I remember it being part of your ash can and, you know, it had been there sort of in the background going, well, we should definitely look into this. And then the, and then the Kickstarter came out and just blew apart. And um, uh, But also in our group, and I'm not going to name names, but I've had conversations sure. with people in Terrible Warriors where a few of them are taking a pass on Cartel. Uh, and I, I think you know where this conversation is going because I read your AMA on Reddit. You, you, this is not the first time you've had to talk about this. Is um, on the surface of Cartel, uh, having it set in uh, real world Mexico and having it set in you know real life cartels with uh, playbooks that on the surface appear stereotypes. Um, these other players, they're taking a pass. They don't want to take something that seems uh, exploitive or, uh, I mean... Uh, it can be appropriative with, with, with the wrong players, uh, and, and it just seemed a little too um, uh, inappropriate from their side uh, to turn that into a game uh, to, to be played, um, where uh, it's a little different with the removal when you're watching Breaking Bad or, or The Wire or Narcos. It, 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 you're, not, you're not a participant in, in, in that. You are. Versus becoming something in Cartel where you might... It become, I mean, so many of our games go off the rails. How easy would it be to turn Cartel into a parody of itself, and how appropriate would that be? From the start, you made a great comment on, on that Reddit AMA of that we need The Wire and we need Black Panther um, for, for, to, to tell those stories. And I'm right. sure, and I'll just let you take it from there. I, how, how would you respond to, to my players here who have those reservations about this game? They, they feel uncomfortable when they see, uh, uh, see it being promoted. Well, I'm, I first I want to ask a question about what you said about being a participant. You said that you weren't a participant when you watched Breaking Bad. I'm not creating that character and, and, and role-playing in that room and, 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 and involved in that story. My participation is uh, voyeuristic, I guess. In, in, in I'm watching and I'm along for the story, but it's something that is... Um, is being served up to me to as a consumer versus uh, a creator uh, in, in, a, in a role-playing situation where um, uh, I'm more injected into this story and 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 I I mean I I'm, I'm I'm playing this advocate for for these other these are not things I personally agree with this is I I'm excited to find out what cartel has to offer um, but it's a uh, there's a there's a, there's a disconnect versus watching a, a movie or, or watching a TV show versus r- creating these characters and and and, uh, uh, and turning this into a, a different kind of entertainment. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of ways to talk about this, and I've talked about the nature of games and what we need in terms of like the Wire versus Wakanda and everything. I pick up on this issue because I think it's interesting that people are more willing to watch stories, uh, watch drug stories written by white people than they are to help write those stories themselves in their basements. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting thing for me that somehow watching a story written by a white person like the wire, which was, which, you know, certainly had black writers and black creators, but is pioneered by a Jewish Baltimore resident, like, you know, not, not a person of color within that, within that community that nobody ever seems to worry that, he wasn't authentically black enough to watch the wire, to write the wire. And I say that because I think people have a very interesting view of what their participation is. And it's one of the reasons that cartel is not a fantasy story about elves who sell elven blood or something like that. Right? Like there, there's a lot of ways I could have taken the core story of cartel and I could have made a metaphor out of it. Right? I could have said, well, you're not really playing Mexican 
drug lords. You're playing elves who are doing elf stuff in this future society where elf stuff is illegal, right? And what I want from Cartel is exactly, I think, the discomfort that you're saying, mm. which is I want people to think about when they say, I don't feel like playing this game, what does the word playing mean and what does the word game mean? Like, I'm not asking that flippantly. Why do we talk about these things as games? When I sit down to play a role-playing game, what am I saying? Is it the same as me playing uh, a video game? Is it the same as me playing a board game? When I play Rising Sun, which is the the new, you know, cool mini or not, big, you know, Eric like board game, should I be worried that my players are going to show up in kimonos and yellow face? Yeah, these are these are excellent points, and I think <laughs> when we're uh, playing games like um, uh, traditional games uh, like Dungeons and Dragons, I don't think we question when we uh, are going through caves and killing goblins and, and 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 participating in that combat because it is a video game very mentality and uh coming into cartel i had conversations with sarah about bluebeard's bride and 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 i remember yeah. talking with jane gates from green ronin about the similar idea of when we look at it, specifically with bluebeard's bride um because i had expressed discomfort of being uh, a, a man running um Bluebeard's yeah. Bride on a podcast uh, and, and presenting this game uh, from a perspective that's not mine to have. And uh, this idea that if I take a game written by women and separate it and say, this is too precious for me to play, uh, I put it into that pink ghetto and I make it this other thing that is a disservice to, to that story and to the people that made it. And, and men should play Bluebeard's Bride. And uh, a group of white players up in Toronto should play cartel and it is uncomfortable and that's kind of the point right <laughs> uh, yeah, play these it's, conflicting it's characters yeah. who your character in cartel might not want to be there either by the way and exactly. it's, they just yeah. don't have an option and uh yep. and, 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 and to then be in that environment um if you're squirming in your seat I think the game is doing its job yeah, and actually what I have found is that very few people continue squirming in their seat after the first 10 or 15 minutes. And the reason is because uh, it's interesting to me that people describe the characters, the playbooks in Cartel as stereotypes. So in Mask, you can play the Legacy or the Protégé or the Bull. Those are types, man. Sure. Those, are, those are pretty specifically like you can point at those characters and be like, that the bull, like that, that's, it's a lot of characters, but it's also Wolverine, man. Yeah. Like he's got, he's got these loves, he's got these powers, he, he's, you know, he's pretty good at what he does and what he does isn't very nice. Like that's the bull, right? Of course, of um, course. And, and Monster Hearts, the same way with the vampire, the werewolf and the ghoul and, and in Bluebeard's Bride yep. with the virgin and the fatal. I mean, those are all... Yep female stereotypes, feminine stereotypes. Right. And, feminine uh, stereotypes. And, 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 and yet there seems to be, at least the conversations I follow, there's this, like, a disconnect where in fantasy, you have that with Bluebeard's Bride and, and with games like Masks, there's, a, like, a disconnect in that it's a fantasy world and it's yep. one step removed from uh, reality. And, uh, uh, like, they go back on Star Trek as well, how they would tell their social commentary stories by making it about right. aliens rather than about humans in the civil rights movement now they're just black on one side white on the other and it's not about america now um right and <laughs> be comfortable white people it's right? not about you right? and, and 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 you can have that story and even 7c it's not our history it's one step just one step to the side uh and cartel doesn't take that step cartel sets it in durango and it's yeah right well, but, here but, in our world Sure, but it's also not in our world. Like, I think it's interesting to me that people folk fixate on the use of the Sinaloa drug cartel in Durango as real places. I am not interested in teaching you the history of Durango. Like, that's not at all what... Like, if you think Breaking Bad is actually set in Albuquerque, I have some very bad news for you. Mm -hmm. The city's geography doesn't match up. The locations that they go to are, are not the places people go. Yep. Like... It's it's like saying if you think the Dresden Files is set in Chicago, it's not. Like it's not. It's not set in Chicago. It's set in the Dresden version of Chicago. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, and and that's that's not to say, of course, obviously Dresden is a fantasy Chicago, so that's easy to get your head around. But it is also the case that the wire does not really represent Baltimore. Like 
that's not everyone's lived experience within that city, right? And I think this question of what is real and how close are we to realness is a question that, that Cartel raises. Because when you say that you're a Sicario, that's not a stereotype. There's a whole bunch of people who are Sicarios and their job is to be enforcers for one of the largest criminal organizations on the planet. Playing one of them is not necessarily giving way to a stereotype. And in fact, why I chose PBTA to, to do this game is specifically because I can tell you, here are the character types you can play. Mm -hmm. You can be a cook, you can be a nar El Narco, you can be a spouse, you can be the dirty cop, you can be the, the, the enforcer. What you can't be is a random Mexican gangbanger who has no connection to anything and whose life is a joke. Like you, you can't, you can't make that character. I've taken away your ability to make stereotypes and play them as stereotypes. What I've given you instead is a set of archetypes. And as you play them, well, if you decide that the best thing to do is a speedy Gonzalez accent and not really invest your character with any emotional seriousness, well, that sounds like it's more about you than me, my friend. Mm -hmm. What I want you to do is play your characters like they're people. And since you're a person, that shouldn't be too difficult. When I run the game, by about 30 minutes in, the players have the players have understood that yes, we're playing in Mexico, and yes, these tropes are Mexican, and yes, a lot of the game is in Spanish in the sense that all the playbooks are named in Spanish and the moves are named in Spanish and things. But what they're really doing is playing a story of people who are down on their luck and in desperate positions trying to make it through the day, sometimes the very worst day of their life. Right? And by the end of the first session, they're completely bought into these people that they have made. And when I say like, what is a game? What does it mean to play a game? How is it different than participating in Breaking Bad? I think it's interesting that people, like I said, are more comfortable effectively giving their money, giving their attention, giving their praise to a show that virtually erased Latinos from Albuquerque, my hometown, than they are embracing a narrative that they make at their house that no one will ever see mm -hmm. but them. I mean, obviously, if you're a podcaster, you're saying you have a slightly higher bar. But it's a little <laughs> different for us. But I, I see well, your point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which One, is what we were narrative. saying about Powered by Apocalypse games. They, they, yep. they corral you into a way of thinking. They introduce yes. what, what, what is available in this world and, 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 and help you, def, you know, at least in those early stages, create that, the process that your character might yes. be thinking in versus yes. a, whether it's a teenager or, or a Mexican cook for the cartel or uh, yep. a, a, um, a, a superhero. And the as you get comfortable then within that framework, then you can start pushing against the walls and seeing, you know, where, where are the soft spots in this world and, 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 and where are the hard points where there's no escape from and, 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 and exploring within that framework that's provided. And, and, you're, and, and, and I, 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 I think that's an excellent point. A Powered by Apocalypse game doesn't allow you to um, go uh, completely off the map and, 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 and be totally inappropriate um, the way a, a, a completely freeform game like something like more like Fiasco may may lend itself to, um, there 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 are there's a structure to it. Exactly, like I think Fiasco is an interesting one in that, in the many ways, cartel cartel games play like Fiasco sessions with a very different sort of rule set and a very different set of pressures. But yes, the characters have very bad days, and those bad days spiral into tough choices that they have to make. And it's interesting to me that once you make it about Mexicans and once you make it about the drug war, that suddenly people have a much higher degree of, of nervousness and anxiety about what, what's happening at the table. And having been a, a person of color gaming for a long time, mm -hmm. I would say that, that almost every system I've ever played has had a player at the table who appropriates something or does an offensive accent or, or decides in their background for their character that they, you know, just happen to be a part of the Confederacy, right? Like all of those moments for me as a gamer of color are always this sort of like shake of the head as I watch white people do what white people often do, which is trample all over what to me is a very obvious set of boundaries, but they're not obvious to them. And I think what Cartel does is it points out that which should already be clear. It's showing Mexican you that you've people. always seen the nose on your face. You've just been ignoring exactly. it the whole time. It's always been yeah. there. And, it's always and, been there. Uh, and it does, like, I can, uh, I mean, I can relate, uh, to be honest, about that feeling of, um, 
trying not to be culturally appropriative of of uh, of a story and uh, w- even when we did we did Scion second edition a little while ago when it was when it was doing its Kickstarter and they let us play the game during that time um, cool and what we did part of it is because it was a podcast and we're pr- producing we're showing it to everyone uh, it, all of our backgrounds just ended up being our own personal backgrounds so uh, I'm Irish so the deities were the Tuatha de Dana uh, and, oh, cool. uh, and then we had uh, Cassie with, uh, with, with Japanese uh, mythology and, and, and histories there and then Mike Dodd uh, is uh, uh, is indigenous and and his um, uh, rules uh, and and deities came from uh, North American cultures and, and and as specific as we could get to his actual tribe, and so That's cool. it was really it was kind of, it was really neat to 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 show that off. Yeah, um, that's awesome. But uh, would I have uh, taken Cassie's deity background during that game at that time in my? development as a player probably not um and uh, i would i just i felt more comfortable just doing the irish thing and and going there and not taking someone else's mythology and religion and deities and 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 playing them like like action figures in this in this story um and uh, uh certainly i think cartel has shown it's uh it's you know you've got you had your stretch goals put out uh there's a berlin 1981 and uh, the the cyberpunk set in yeah, the future F1 one, 2033. Yeah, yeah, with with the Diablo body snatchers, uh, which just sounds yeah. super rad. Um, and it shows like highlighting these are these are stories about yeah people going through the, the worst day in their lives, stories of loyalty, stories of um, uh, yeah. It's uh, I think these are important stories to tell. Uh, and well, and that's it's also why like I. You know, I, when you say pe- white people should play cartel, I'm like that's very kind, but it's also a really sad game. <laughs> it is, it is, yeah. I mean, if, if you if you want to have a happy time, I mean, look into a Pelion instead. This is, I mean, you might, you, you're, yeah, yeah. you're going to feel a little drained when it's all said and done, right? This is a whole yeah. other conversation, though. Uh, people who uh, we're not like I'm going to play Bluebeard's Bride uh, sooner rather than later, I hope. Uh, but there are absolutely players in our, in our group. I'm not playing that game. I'm not doing it. Yeah, it's, it's too I much. want, I want to have, much, I want to have man. fun when I'm playing. And that is just not that is not my definition of a fun time. Um, for and, sure. And this for idea sure. that you know some people come to RPGs for a different goal. You, some just want to roll dice, fight monsters, get the loot, and just have a you know high scores. Beer and, beer and pretzels. Yeah, like, sit, exactly. Sit with your friends. Play no a little question. nerd poker. I mean, and uh, for sure. and then and then there's others who want to come and uh, uh, do some interior decorating in a house they've never been to before, and uh, yeah. and, and 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 experience a, a, a perspective or a worldview or a story or or a, or a collection of emotions that um, w- may not be something that you would experience in such a controlled setting, right? And uh, uh, that that just because Bluebeard's Bride or Cartel isn't a you know, quote fun time doesn't make it not uh, enjoyable or enriching. Certainly after the fact, looking back at the play report and being like, okay, yeah, we, after the aftercare <laughs> is done, you've had a you know shot of tequila when it's over, <laughs> and you can look back at oh that game was badass, it was amazing, but oh yeah. my god, did it really take it out of me? We we often joke at the office that that I write games uh, where with the fun that is not fun. Right, as if as if it's a French phrase, right? You know, the the fun that is not fun, uh, because when you play cartel, it's hilarious and heartbreaking, and you laugh and then you cry and then you laugh some more, and that's kind of like how I live my life. Yeah, right? is like the laughing and the crying and then the laughing again. And yeah, so the the, the, the image my... of the, this is fine, but the room's on fire. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and there's this really interesting thing where like when the session starts, everybody's characters like, okay, as long as my secrets stay secret, yeah. we're good. You're all optimistic. And then by the end. Of, by the end of the session, they've lost those secrets, they've lost their loved ones, they've lost the next thing, and they say, great, cool, let's play session two. <laughs> and you're like, you're like, but what about all these, you said, you like, have as nothing. long as what? your secrets, and they're like, well, it's fine, we're going to push forward, we're going to be okay, right? And, and it reminds me of the way that we actually drown. We do not drown all at once. We drown because whatever we thought was our limit, we'll go well past that mm-hmm. and think we can still pull it off. And yet... What I really want for our industry is not for everybody to play cartel, but for there to be so many Latino games that you have your pick. So we're working with uh, Brandon Leon Gambetta to do Pasión de las Pasiones, which yes. is a, a telenovela PBTA game. If you like 
cheeky fun antics. It is the cheeky and fun to my tragic and cruel. Oh my god! Uh, it is, I showed it is that a to Bree. Wonderful Bri. game. <laughs> I showed that to Bree, who played our Dirk of Ison character from the Seventh Sea, who was all like, "Look at me!" Who fell in love with the bishop? And I showed them this, this, this ash can. Yes. Like, oh my yes. goodness! We we got to just put Dirk into this soap opera and have this <laughs> insane time. Um, yes. And uh, yes. Uh, that's definitely another one that's that's on our list that we're gonna get over to. And, uh, yeah, and if you feel like Cartel is too real, then you might want to check out Miguel Angel Espinosa, uh, his, his new game, Noal, which is based on a really famous comic book in Mexico um, called Operation Bolivar. Um, and in that, you play uh, basically uh, were jaguars who kill angels and sell their meat. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty wild. <laughs> uh, but, like, basically, it is, like, this sort of urban fantasy version of cartel, like, where, yes, you're involved in this sort of crazy illicit trade, but there's also these, like, you know, you are a Noales, which is, like, a were person. Like, you can summon aspects of animals. There's these angels that came over with the conquistadors that are, like, terrorizing ordinary people. And so it has this definitely Mexican feel, this definite crime fiction feel, but it is so crazy and over the top, so metal that it's a totally different thing than Cartel, which roots itself in sort of hilarity and drama and pain uh, and sadness, but also back to the funny. Um, yeah, Cartel Noel doesn't seem to put like, on the soft filter. That's right, no, yeah, it's, yeah. It's all hard edges. <laughs> it's all hard edges. But Nawal is like this crazy fever dream, right? Like where you're shifting into alternate forms and hunting angels. Um, yeah, like It's the animated games, version. Yeah, those yeah. games for me are the beginning of what I hope is a Latino library of experiences. Excellent. And that, that I don't have to tell somebody, well, look, you can play Steal Away Jordan or you cannot play anything by a black person. I want to be able to tell them, here is a huge range of black experiences, Asian experiences, Latino experiences, and role-playing games. Take your pick. Play something. Right. And and so for me, hopefully, Cartel is the beginning of a whole push for Latino experiences and role playing games. Um, and we're excited as a company to support it. And I'm excited as a designer to support it. It looks beautiful. The art looks phenomenal. Uh, I was very excited to see the cart uh, the, uh, the the Kickstarter succeed as well as it did. I'm looking forward to getting my copy. Uh, and uh, as uh, so, you've touched on it now. I mean, the the future of Magpie. Well, let's, let's, we started there. Your origin story. We've gone through uh, what you've done. The challenges we're currently facing today. Um, and uh, you've touched on here, like Magpie is. Uh, uh, is it the only? It's certainly one of the only uh, my, uh, majority majority minority owned uh, mm. uh, tabletop companies publishers, um, and you, you certainly set uh, a mission for 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 what Magpie and the games that you're presenting and the uh, the people that write for masks and the the, the stories that are being told. Uh, what what can we expect here as as fans of Magpie? We love your games. We play them all the time. I'm gonna I'm not gonna stop. Awesome, man. Thank um, you. Wh where yeah. where is Magpie going for us? Well, we we tend to think in waves. I mean, Masks is coming to a close. Uh, Brennan just released the Secrets of Ages book on PDF, and it's at the printer now. Mm -hmm. Masks Unbound, which is the final supplement funded by the Kickstarter, will be released this year. Um, so that's that's coming to a close. Bluebeard's Bride uh, under Marissa Kelly's extremely diligent project management. I mean, Marissa is a, a taskmaster. Uh, that is also going to come to a close this year. Um, so the, the projects that we're looking into the future, number one, um, we're working on uh, wrapping up our game Zombie World, which is a game Brendan and I have been working on for a couple of years, in which uh, you play survivors of a zombie apocalypse who have formed a new community, an enclave, somewhere in the world and are trying to kind of get through their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and what's cool about the game is, in addition to being a pretty fun zombie movie, zombie TV show simulator, uh, it uses cards instead of dice. So rather than rolling dice to do Powered by the Apocalypse moves, you draw from a deck of cards, including bite cards. Meaning every time you deal with zombies, you draw a card from a deck to see if you've been bit. Oh dear. But the, the deck does not refresh until somebody gets bit. Oh dear. So there's this tension that you get from a zombie TV show where you're like, well, nobody got bit this episode. And then the next episode. And then the next episode. And you just know that bite yeah. is coming. The longer right? it there's goes, the higher that tension. Eventually, it has to happen. 
Yep, oh, and dear. a lot of what's fun about Zombie World is you get dealt three random cards for your character. Because everybody would love to be Daryl, right? But some yeah. of us are an accountant who just happened to survive yeah. the apocalypse, right? Of course. So we're doing a bunch of fun and interesting things with cards. And I really want it to be the kind of thing where you grab this box and you can take it to your, your buddy's house who's never played role-playing games and very quickly be like, bam, 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 here's a role-playing game. It can seat six to eight people. Like, it's really fast. It's fun. It's, it's yeah. chaotic. And then if you want to do a campaign the last 25 sessions, it also has the capacity to do that as well. So a very flexible, very fun, very uh, light but uh, uh, tenacious engine um, that uses Powered by the Apocalypse in some new ways. And then, of course, we're still pumped to work on projects like Velvet Glove, which is Sarah's, uh, yeah. Sarah's super serious, interesting look. And I say super serious with big quotes around it because it's it's kind of a fun uh, black exploitation girl exploitation uh, take on the '70s girl gang, right? Um, and that's something that we're going to be supporting as well in the next year. Yeah, switchblades um, and leather jackets and. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, <laughs> and then way down the road, we're looking at Passion de las Passiones. We're working with Julia Ellingbow on a new game from her, the creator of Steal Away Jordan, um, and of course Brendan's next uh, title that he's been working on for a long time is Armored Society, which is a, a little bit like Jane Austen meets Game of Thrones meets Fairies, um, which I, I can't say a lot more about. But like, we've got a lot of stuff planned. If only. Writing books and designing games was faster. Yeah, well, I mean, Magpie, you've always got Kickstarters coming out. You've always got, like, it seems like two or three projects at different stages all happening, sort of overlapping one another, like in a game of Leapfrog. And uh, it, it, it's exciting. It keeps, like, me excited going, like, we, we will never uh, run out of games to play uh, and, and, and enjoy. And, uh, and that's a lot of that's uh, thanks to all the work you put into it. Um, so, anyway. Thank, thank you, man. You. We, there are days at the office where we're like, we moved the ball an inch today. What is the point? <laughs> and so it's great to hear that people are like, you know, actually playing games and having a good time. That that warms my heart, man. Yeah, really and I, I think like uh, uh, changing the hearts and minds of my players there in that game of masks. Uh, now we've played through masks and uh, I'm moving uh, apartments this month. So I'm like, I can't run a game, everyone. I'm, I'm packing. Uh, so they were like, well, why don't we go and play Apocalypse World then? And they've never, like Damn. I said, they, 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 they've yes. done like Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder were the only, and, and, and the old Paranoia XP were the only games they'd ever played. And uh, and then uh, they've, they've gone from that. Now we're doing Apocalypse World, but they're running it. And I'm just, I'm, I'm playing uh, the Maestro D there, so I can like join in for the game. But if I'm not there, I'm just hanging out at the bar and they're off doing their thing. Um, ah, that's such a great feeling. And, and, and they've, they've created this, they're so suckered into this world now that when we return to Masks, this Apocalypse World game is going to be a comic series in our Halcyon world. So, right? <laughs> like, because you wouldn't have superhero comics in a superhero. Like, that's the whole thing with Watchmen is they didn't have, they had pirate comic books in that world because everyone was a superhero. Uh, so Halcyon wouldn't have superhero comics. They've got this uh, Mad Max thing that, that all the uh, kids are passing around. That's so they're, awesome, they're really man. into the malevolent world and the stories of Cobra, Janky, and Baron Sprog and, and all these characters. That's great. So it's, it's, it's like it's, the pirate comics in Watchmen. Exactly like that. And, uh, yeah, that's so, perfect. So it's, 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 really, it's been really interesting. Although I keep having to try and get them, like, you are teenagers, you're supposed to go to school, and they just want to keep hanging out <laughs> at the abandoned train yard that they've turned into their base. So I have to keep sending, like, social workers their way who might also be superheroes that are trying to, like, you know, yeah, you yeah. really need to look after your, like, education or you're just going to not be ready to take on this world and you're going to be doing yourself a disservice. They're like, no, man, we're going to smash light bulbs and be superheroes. It's like, okay, this is, you're making it difficult for me. I'm having to feel like the adult here. <laughs> so That's perfect, man. That sounds a, great. Well, it's been a lot of fun. It's, it's cool to see people. Uh, one of the things that I think as a designer you don't, you don't always get to experience is the ways in which people remix, recreate, and string together their experiences as players. And that's such a great example of the, the comic book series in the other world that, that like just brings such joy to my heart. And is the reason why this hobby survives is because, yes, as designers, we lay out some cool stuff for you to pick from. But ultimately, it's the GMs and the players who make these things their own. Um, and we're just really honored that so many people are excited about the world that we're building, about the systems we're building, and about the, the stories that we want you to tell. So um, we're pumped, man. Thank you so much for, for running stuff. It means a lot to us. And it, it means a lot for me to be able to have spent so much time talking to you. We went a little over time here. Thank you. Um, uh, 
thank you for joining me today. Uh, thank you for making the games that we have enjoyed. Uh, I am very much looking forward to playing Cartel, and I will let you know how it goes. Uh, and I hope that you'll be back here, uh, because uh, I have a feeling in like six months you'll have a hundred more things to talk about, uh, given how much things have gone on. Uh, you are welcome back at yeah. our table at any time, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. We'll talk soon. <laughs>